Hi, my name is Taza Shamming, and I'm here in Jackson Hole, Wyoming, studying Clark's Nutcrackers. Why should I study this little bird? Well, this bird plays an enormous role in this entire ecosystem. In the high alpine, at the tree line, there's this species of tree called the white bark pine, which really holds this entire ecosystem together. This is one of the only tree species that can survive up at this highest elevation in this region. During the winter, these trees act as a mechanism to capture and trap snow. This means that the water melts slower over the spring and summer, which ensures there's a steady flow of water into the rivers and into the valley. As the climate is warming, deadly beetles and an invasive fungus called blister rust have been invading these higher elevations, destroying the white bark pines. So the only way for the white bark pine to survive is if it can successfully reproduce. Enter the Clark's Nutcracker. The Clark's Nutcracker and the white bark pines have actually co-evolved for tens of thousands of years. White bark pine cones don't actually open by themselves. Clark's Nutcrackers are really the only animal that efficiently opens the cones, gathers the seeds, and then plants them. If the trees disappear, this entire ecosystem will be in jeopardy. The problem is, we know almost nothing about the Clark's Nutcracker. That's what I'm here to find out. To carry out this research, the first thing I need to do is catch nutcrackers. So today, we're off to go catch some birds. Now that we've reached the hills, we're going to head up to that tree at the base of it and we're going to take off our, our skis, stash them, and put on our snowshoes and hike up to the trapping site. This tree looks like it was probably killed by beetles a couple of years ago. This tree is at least a few hundred years old, but they can live over a thousand years, so it could be a lot older than I, than I think it is. It's sad. It's sad to see a tree that's been around for hundreds and hundreds of years, potentially since the Middle Ages, uh, now dead. Because of global warming, we have uh, created conditions that are really good for the pine beetles. So the pine beetles have been able to have more young in the summertime because they've got a longer growing season and their larvae aren't dying in the fall. So the beetles are surviving better and moving up into these elevations and killing these trees because of something that we as humans have done. You can pull up the bark and look underneath to see these uh, tunnels, these J-shaped tunnels, which are indicative of the mountain pine beetles. Usually once the beetles hit it, it's dead within just a couple of years. Great, well here we are. We are in Bridger Teton National Forest. When I first get here every morning, I'm super excited to catch birds and really hopeful, but always a little bit anxious because some days I sit here all day long and wait for birds to come and never catch a single one. Okay, I think that's good for now. I'm going to go set up the net. So this is a bow net. There's a little lever right here which holds down um, this metal, metal half circle. And I'm going to bring this string up to where I'm sitting. But just make sure it works. It works. <laughs> I leave this be fat up in these in these cages. This has been hanging here for I'm going to guess maybe two weeks now. I use the bee fat just because the birds seem to love it. Definitely a little bit more wary of playing with bee fat when it's bear season. I've never had bears at my trapping sites, but once I was climbing up actually the hill that's a few miles back over there to one of my survey areas and I was actually following fresh bear tracks and in some ways I was kind of happy about it because the snow was two feet deep and it was fresh snow so I was going in above my knees um, until I hit the bear tracks and then I was able to follow the bear tracks but it meant there's a bear in front of me. Um, it's a little, a little scary. <laughs> so it's about 9.15 now. Um, there's definitely nutcrackers around, which is great. Hopefully they'll be into the suet soon. But we'll be hanging out here for the next seven hours. And my mind completely wanders. <laughs> I've got a lot of time to think.
It's definitely in a bit of an adrenaline rush every time. So the first thing I'm going to do is put the aluminum band on this bird. When you go to band them, it's really important to hold the joints of the bird. You have to be really careful with them. Um, it's really important to not hold them tightly, but hold them very firmly because you wouldn't want them to break anything. So I just put this on the leg, squeeze it down, let go. Oh, he's got me. <laughs> Luckily his beak isn't, he's not, uh, that strong. This doesn't hurt, hurt too badly. Birds like cardinals are terrible. They actually cause blisters. But he doesn't seem to want to let go. There we go. So now I'm going to put on the radio. This guy's going to be 151.482. And it just goes on like a little bit, little backpack. It goes over his head, which is hard. You've got to be very careful because you don't want to hit their eyes. So go over one eye first. And I hold it, and then I can always hold their beak together. Oh, he's definitely got my finger bleeding. <laughs> we, uh, he got me, he got me with his claws. So once I put this radio on and let him go, we're going to follow him around for the next several months. And we really want to figure out how big his home range is and what habitats are they using. Um, we really want to know that because if the white bark pines decline, we want to know how we can help preserve these these birds in this area. There we go. Through the winter into early summer, I continue to trap as many birds as possible. The summer is a really exciting time. I continue radio tracking and try to discover what the birds are doing. We are at Shadow Mountain right now. You can hear the beeping sound. When it's stronger, it means it's pointing at the bird. And the strongest signal is coming from this direction. So we're just going to head straight, straight towards the signal. It is definitely in this direction. I don't really know how far, but keep going in that direction. So it's that way. I, I get tired sometimes and I usually just walk a little slower. <laughs> so we just came from that other hill and it was telling us the strongest signal was this way. And now we just came down and back up to this hill. And the strongest signal is back in that valley. So I think we're circling him right now. I found him. There he is. You can see him up at the top of that dead tree. Right on top of the hill right there. So for the next two hours, we're going to follow him around and document his behavior. So right now, I'm watching 15. He's at the top of a limber pine tree, and he's pounding on the limber pine cone that's right at the top of the tree. But yep, right now, 15 is pounding on, on the cone. What he's doing is he's pulling the cone scales away from the cone itself, and he's taking the seed out. He's totally taking seeds out of his um, sublingual pouch. He like lifts his head up and kind of like takes the seed out and then he's putting them in the end of his beak and he's hiding them in a tree. He's hiding them in this dead tree right here. It's always so exciting. I feel like the more time I spend watching nutcrackers, just the more exciting behavior I see. And it's pretty cool because I've been following regularly since March. So I see where they go and what they do on an individual basis. And these, these two are especially cool because we have both of the pair uh, radioed it's kind of amazing how much time they spend with each other. It's exciting. I love it. I, I, I love what I do. <laughs> I feel, feel pretty, pretty lucky to be able to spend my days right here. We're up at about 8,600 feet right now. And this place is really unique because it's full of white bark pine. White bark pines are really interesting and in then they often grow in clumps. If you look at this tree right here, it's actually three trunks growing from the same base. And 
um, scientists attribute that to nutcracker caches. Nutcracker caches are usually between one and seven seeds, most often two, three, four seeds in a hole, and which means that often more than one seed grows up. And one of the ways that these trees have evolved to entice the nutcrackers to come eat their seeds is all of the cones are found at the top of the tree. So when a nutcracker flies over top of the tree, it looks down and it sees a feast ready to be eaten. The biggest problem is that the white bark pines are declining really fast. You can, if you look around, all of the white bark pines, or most of the white bark pines are dying or dead. Um, it's crazy to see how many of these trees are actually dead. If you look around, there's a dead white bark, there's a dead white bark, there's a dead white bark, there's a dead one, there's a dead one. They're dead in every direction. All of the trees that are this big seem to be dead. Um, this has been killed by beetles. If you pull apart the bark and you look underneath, you can see all of these galleries. It's so sad. It's so sad, especially because so many of them are dead. You tell people the trees are dying, but people don't really realize until they get out here and look around and realize that almost 100% of the white bark pine trees are either dead already or they're sick. It's, it's heartbreaking. So we are all done for today. We're heading back down from the top of uh, the top of the ridge near Togadi. Tomorrow we will go look for more birds.